notions that I know very little about the non-commutative world, just uh, some basic notions. And for me, it's a mystery that uh, some, some result could be maybe transferred to the uh, non-commutative world. And in this case, when you don't know a field very well, like me for uh, the non-commutative world, intuition can be a bad, a bad friend sometimes. So it's just, I'm glad that to, uh, to share some ideas with you to see if uh, some extensions are meaningful or not. So all the, the talk will be based on just on the commutative world and the standard moment SOS hierarchy. And uh, there have been already uh, some notion uh, yesterday in some talks. So it will be easy uh, for me to present the basics. Ah, yes, let me put it on. So um, some material uh, I present here are contained in this book. It was in 2009. And uh, more recent one, uh, just more related to uh, algebraic optimization, and there is also this nice uh, collection of uh, chapters by uh, uh, those uh, nice guys also here from the uh, or in the U.S. And I will start by saying why polynomial optimization should be a, a specific topic compared to optimization in general. Then I will present what are the LP and SDP certificate of positivity. The moment LP and moment SOS approaches. In fact, I will concentrate on the moment SOS approach because the moment LP has some drawbacks. And mo more interesting, maybe for you, is wha what what kind of field uh, can be uh, touched by this theory and uh, how, how the moment SOS hierarchy can be applied in 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 application sometimes completely outside optimization. So let's start with the uh, global optimization problem. Uh, what do you want to compute F star? which is a global minimum of f when x uh, lies in this set defined by polynomial inequalities. So why should we make a big deal about these kind of problems? Because, uh, I mean, at least from the from point of view of, optimize, of, of optimizers, this is just a particular case of nonlinear programming. And, uh, okay, and that's true. Uh, so if you are interested in a, in a local optimum only, uh, the fact that f and gg are polynomial does not help much. If you open the textbooks in, uh, in uh, optimization and you look at algorithm to minimize a function f under constraints, uh, when you look for local minimum, uh, the fact that the uh, f and gg are polynomial is not really, really used in the, in the algorithms. Okay. But for global optimization, the picture is different. And remember, just to see wh why, why, why it is true, uh, one way to rewrite the global minimum is to say that it's a soup of lambda, scalar lambda, so that f minus lambda is non-negative for each in k. It's just a triviality to say that, right? But this is just not true for a local minimum. This is really a particular feature of a global minimum. And so if you want to compute the global minimum f star, one needs to take to handle efficiently, as much as possible, let's say, the difficult constraint that f of x minus lambda should be positive for all x in k. So I give you a la scalar lambda, f is given, but checking this is very difficult in general. So if you would like to manipulate, to, to solve this problem, I, I, somehow you have to, to deal efficiently with these constraints, right? And you need, for that, you need tractable certificates of positivity on k for this polynomial f of x minus lambda. And in fact, when, when the, the, your data has uh, uh, algebraic data, like f is a polynomial and gg is a polynomial, then Indeed, real algebraic geometry in this case helps a lot because you have powerful certificates of positivity. Okay, and not only you have that, but uh, uh, perhaps importantly, such certificates are amenable to practical computation. For example, we'll see, we will see that the uh, Poutinard positive still and sat, which is at the basis of the moment uh, sum of squares, uh, uh, also exists for analytic functions, which is a much more general framework, but uh, it's, it's Particularly useless from a computational point of view, so uh, that's why the sometimes in, mat in pure mathematics you would like to have a, a result which is as general as possible, but for in applied mathematics point of view, sometimes it's better to restrict your uh, framework to be able to do some practical uh, computation. Uh, pure math doesn't care, but in applied math we, we are more uh, uh, picky about this. So what is the uh, SOS based certificate? It's very very easy to see. Uh, so you start by, uh, defini by uh, def de defining a, a basic semi-algebraic set, uh, which will be compact. Uh, 
So it's defined by finitely many polynomial inequality. And as it is assumed to be compact, you, you, in fact, for the technicality, you, it is in, contained in a, bull, in a ball of radius uh, uh, m, for some big m. And for technicality reasons, you can put these constraints in the definition of k, with g1 equals this. So it doesn't change the set k, but it's it, it just uh, technicality to apply the, this theorem. So what Sputinar's positive census theorem said, states is the following. So it, was, it dates back to 1993. And uh, if f is strictly positive on k, then there is a way to see why it is positive. Because there is a way to write f in a certain manner, which makes obvious that it is positive on k. So that's why we call it a certificate of positivity. So f can be written in this case as a, a linear combination of the GJ that define the set k. And the weights are some polynomial which are sum of squares. And there is an, you are, there is an additional uh, sum of square here. So of course, when x is in, we immediately see that you evaluate f of x, then you, you, you add up only positive things. Because gj of x is not negative, you multiply by a weight which is not negative, you add up, and then you have another quantity which is not negative. OK? So what I like in this theorem is that uh, it, it can be understood by a freshman at university. It's very powerful, very general. The proof is far from being trivial, but the statement itself is very simple. And uh, it's very rare in mathematics that you have a, a powerful theorem, very easy, e easy to understand, and with practical applications. I mean, it's not that common. Uh, there is something to be careful uh, when you read this theorem is about the degree of the SOS uh, weights. Nothing is said in this theorem about the, uh, the degree. For example, uh, uh, f could be quadratic, for example. gj could be quadratic. And if f is po this quadratic function is positive set k, it might happen that you need to check by, by the theorem of Futinar. You know that you can write it like this. But the weights could be a degree maybe 20,000. And the fact is that uh, degree two, when, when you develop this, this polynomial in the basis of monomial, for example, it will have only non-zero term for degree zero, one, and two. But because of cancellations, all other uh, uh, coefficients will be zero. But those guys are not, could be very high degree polynomial. Okay? Uh, and that's why uh, there is no non nice bound on the degree, given the degree of f and the degree of g. Otherwise, if you had the nice bound on that, you would have, you would have proved that p equal np. But good news, uh, testing whether this uh, identity holds for some sum of square with an a priori degree bound fixed is just solving an SDP. So now, if I want to check if this is true, a given f and gj, if you would like to, to, to see if this statement is true, you have to compute sigma 0 and sigma j. And you assume that you, you want to check if this is true for all weights possible weights, I mean, if you can find weights, sorry, with degree bound, let's say, fixed in advance. The degree of sigma 0 and sigma j should be less than 10, for example. If you fix this constraint and you try to check this, it's just solving an SDP. OK? And this theorem, which is nice, is, is a theorem in real algebraic geometry. It has a dual facet, which is in functional analysis, which is uh, related to what was already presented yesterday about the k-moment problem. The k-moment problem is, a, is an old problem that dates, dates back to the end of the 19th century with a very uh, strong mathematician like uh, uh, Markov, uh, Stilges, uh, uh, many others. And it's instead of following, you, set, you start from the, set, the same set k as before, and now you are given a sequence, um, uh, real sequence of numbers uh, indexed by this multi-index. And the question is, given those numbers, does there exist a measure mu supported on k so that this y alpha, this color, is the alpha moment of this measure mu? OK? In this case, if this is true, then you say that the sequence y has a representing measure supported on k. OK? And the, theor the dual side of putting our theorem with the same k and the same assumptions, it says the following. The sequence y has a representing measure supported on k if and only if for every integer d, you build up some real symmetric matrix whose entries are linear in, a, in y, and m, m other matrix which are linear in y. In the entries are linear in y. I don't give it too much details. 
the, those two, those m plus one matrices whose size is controlled by d have to be positive semi-definite, and this has to be true for all d. So this md matrix here is called the moment matrix associated with the sequence y, and this this matrix md g j y is called the localizing matrix associated with the sequence y and the polynomial g j. Remarkably, the, uh, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for existence of a representative measure stated only in terms of many LMI conditions, countably many LMI conditions, on the sequence Y. So in the theorem, you don't see the measure mu, so is, which is nice, just a condition on the moments on the scalar Ys, which are the input of your theorem. Okay? So this put in our theorem has two facets. We have seen the algebraic side which is positivity on K, you try to characterize those polynomial F which are positive on K. And the dual facet is in functional analysis, the, which is called the, which is related to the K moment problem. Given a sequence Y, you want to check whether this Y alpha is the alpha moment of some measure of mu supported on K. And the, du the duality between those two sides, just the, uh, the du bracket duality between F and Y given by this, uh, 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 this uh, identity. So in fact, in real algebraic geometry, this theorem by Putinar was a refinement of, uh, of a theorem by uh, Schmudgen, was given to, to in 1991. That's why, for practical computation, this is the one we use, but for the, algebra, the real algebraic community, the, the real breakthrough was the theorem of Schmudgen. That was really a, a breakthrough in real algebraic uh, geometry, and Putinar theorem was seen as a, as a, as a refinement, as a, a math exercise, to uh, to um, simplify the statement of Schmudgen theorem, but for practical computation, this is the one which is important. There is also uh, there is also another algebraic positivity certificate due to Krevin, Basilescu, and Elman, but unfortunately, it's much less powerful than the SOS one, and has some uh, definite drawbacks, at least for the optimization application. So I don't go into details. Here. In fact, polynomials which are non-negative on a set K are uh, almost everywhere. They appear in many important applications outside optimization. As soon as you model your problem as a particular instance of its what is called the generalized moment problem, generalized moment problem has a lot of application in, in many, many fields. What is this uh, GMP? Very simple to state, one line. Uh, and there is two ways of seeing it. That's a primal way and a dual way. So let's see the, the primal view of the uh, GMP. It's an infinite dimensional linear programming problem on a space of mirrors. So your, everything in blue is the data, and in red is the unknown. So it's an optimization problem, where your unknowns are some Borel measures, supported on some set Ki given in advance. Okay? So Ki don't necessarily have the same dimension. So you want to minimize a, a linear functional, which is a sum of linear functional on the mu i, and some linear constraints. So it's a pure linear programming problem, right? But the, the unknowns, it's infinite dimensional because your unknowns are some measures. So uh, formally, you take the, the dual of this problem as you do in, uh, in finite dimensional linear programming. So you will have uh, du dual variables, lambda i, lambda j associated with these constraints. Okay, so that's why the, the variables of your dual you minimize uh, this linear uh, functional, and the constraints say that f i minus lambda j h i j should be positive on k. You see, so you have s constraints, and each constraint is a, is a positivity constraint on some set. Say that the constraint of the G the dual of the GMP said that some functions should be non-negative on certain set k. So if you see that immediately, if f i and h i j are polynomials, right? Then you would you, you can replace these constraints by positive certificate of Putinar, for example, and that will do the job. So I will see that we, we will see that global optimization, the one I, I described at the beginning, in fact is the simplest instance of the GMP. Why? Because you can always write, write F star. There is another way of writing what is a global minimum. We have seen one way. F minus lambda, soup of lambda such that F minus lambda is non negative on K. But there is also this, this simple uh, the trick to see F star is equal to what? The infimum of uh, F d mu 
over all priority measure mu supported on K. Okay? So there is a simple example of a GMP because you have only one unknown measure and one constraint. You cannot make it simpler, right? And why is it true? Because I if f of x is greater than f star, which is a global minimum for x in k, and mu is some probability measure on k, then of course f d mu is greater than f star d mu equal f star. So the minimum here cannot be larger than f star. And if you take any x in k, there is at least one measure of mu which gives the same f, f of x. You take the mu equal to, equal to be the, the delta d rack at x. Okay? So those problems are, are completely equivalent. Uh, sorry, and in fact, this one is exactly the dual of uh, the one we have seen or, uh, previously. You have a lambda here, as a, you take the dual of this LP, and the dual of this is soup of lambda, so that f minus lambda is no negative on k. That was uh, the first definition seen of f star. So in fact, those two rephrasing of what is uh, the global minimum as uh, an infinite dimensional LP I is the two facets of seeing the global minimum, one on measure side and one on the Poly uh, polynomial side, algebraic side. Okay. So what are the moment LP and moment SOS approaches? It consists of using a certain type of, po of positivity certificate, uh, this one for the LP approach or this one for the SOS approach, in potentially any applications where such a characterization is needed. And global optimization is only one example. And in, uh, in many situations, this amounts to solving a hierarchy of LPs if you use this certificate, or SDPs if you use this one. And of course, in this hierarchy, you have a, a certain SDP to solve, or LP, and the size increases with the rank in the hierarchy. That's exactly what is the moment SOS approach. And for optimization, for example, how does it translate? It's, it's a very simple message. So remember that the global minimum was this one, and we don't know how to handle this constraint. But you know that there is a way to replace this. You, if you are less, less demanding, I mean, you are more demanding, sorry, you impose that instead of looking for a lambda so that is, this is non-negative on K, you look for a lambda, you fix a D, and you look for a lambda now so that not only it is non-negative on K, but it has also a positivity certificate. Because this one applies this one. And with the weights, sigma J such that the degree is less than 2D. So here you are more demanding than here, but this is tractable. It's an SDP, and of course, when you compute this, since, since you, are, uh, it's, you maximize and you are more demanding, this is less than this. So you get a lower bound. Okay? And this is the SDP associated with the algebraic facet of putting our theorem, because you replace the non-negativity constraint by your positivity certificate. Okay? This SDP has a dual, which is an SDP on moments, which is associated with the k-moment facet of putting our theorem. So I don't go into the Detail, but actually, this uh, 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 dual was presented yesterday in some slides already. So what is nice is that the sequence, when d increases, the sequence of lower bounds <coughs> converges to the global minimum. But moreover, and what is, I would say, important is that uh, generically for optimization, the moment hierarchy has finite convergence. This is a result of uh, Jawangni. You stop at certain step D, generically. And also a sufficient rank condition that we have seen also yesterday, the Courtois-Fialco rank condition to, to decide when you are, when you are, there is a way to check whether F star is equal to F star D when you solve the step D at the step D relaxation. And this rank condition to check is generically satisfied. Okay? It's also a result by uh, Jawangni. And what makes this approach exciting is that at the crossroad of several disciplines application, uh, commutative and non-commutative and nonlinear algebra. In fact, there is a non-commutative version of those positive Stellensatz by Schmutgen, precisely, and Elton. Um, there is also, uh, it has to do with real algebraic geometry and functional analysis, optimization, convex analysis to see the duality, and computational complexity in computer science benefits all those interactions. And uh, as mentioned, and I will try to convince you that potential applications are almost endless. As we've been proved useful and successful in application of modest problem size, uh, cabin optimization, control, robust control, optimal control, estimation, computer vision. And if 
you have, in addition, you have some sparsity pattern in your description in the description of your problem. Then you can solve a problem of much larger size because you can adapt your hierarchy, and there is a sparse version of this hierarchy. And as initiated, they stimulate new resource issue in convex algebraic geometry for representation of convex sets. In computer algebra, algebra for solving polynomial equation, uh, the SDP and border basis. And computational complexity, where the LP and SDP hierarchies now become a, a, an important tool to analyze hardness of approximation for zero one combinatorial problem. Uh, so, uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, both LP and SDP hierarchy are general purpose methods, not tailored to solving specific R problems. And usually, uh, in optimization, when you have a, it's like a hammer to kill a mouse, it will tell you, but this is too general. And in general, when you, solve, when you want to solve a problem efficiently, you have to specialize your algorithm to the kind of problem you solve and not have a general tool. Uh, but when you do this, when you do this uh, approach, uh, you do not distinguish between convex, continuous, non-convex, and zero one one problems. Okay? You don't, just don't care what particular polynomial you have here. For example, if you have a Boolean constraint, then you just say that xi squared minus xi equals zero, which is exactly what you should not do when you look for local optimization. When you do classical optimization and you look for local, optimi local optimum by traditional methods, uh, like gradient descent, Newton uh, descent, and so on. Uh, when you have a Boolean constraint, you never do that. You did never mod model your problem as a constraint like this and apply a, a steepest descent method, for example. People will, will, will tell you immediately, before you do this, just go and read, because you never do that. Okay. Uh, this would be considered stupid. And uh, in fact, uh, the traditional approach is that each class of problems has its own ad hoc Taylor algorithm. If you have a discrete problem, you have some specific methods for solving discrete problems. If you have convex one, you also have some specific uh, methods to solve the convex one. If you have a continuous but non-convex, then you also have some uh, specific methods. And uh, so you, you, you try to make a hierarchy of easy and hard problems. And in this case, I with the moment of source approach, uh, you, you do not specialize to this class of problems. And then, as I said, at first glance, it can be a stupid way of doing because uh, being not specialized, you, you might lose some efficiency. But what is uh, surprising, and this is true for the SOS hierarchy and not true for the LP hierarchy, somehow the uh, SOS hierarchy recognizes the class of easy convex problem, the SOS convex problem. Since when you, in without telling the software that the problem is SOS convex, if you input such a problem, you stop at the first iteration. You compute the global minimum immediately. When it is convex but not SOS convex, you are still have fi finite convergence all the time, but you don't know exactly when. And this, this is not true for the LP hierarchy. In fact, for the LP hierarchy, it's the contrary. If you input a convex problem, except if it is an LP, convex problem which is not an LP, you cannot have exact termination. It's impossible. And, and it's very easy to see. Okay. I don't go into detail, but it's, it's trivial to see why it cannot converge. I mean, converge, but asymptotically. It dominates uh, all the lift and project hierarchies. Uh, so at the other end of the spectrum, for R01 combinatorial problem, it's still one of the most efficient algorithms. So it's, it's, it's remarkable that with this general view of the problem, this is describing your problem by uh, polynomial equality and inequality, when it is an easy problem, you still are efficient. Maybe not the best algorithm for convex optimization, but at least efficient. And if you go at the end of the spectrum of hard problems, the zero one combinatorial one, you still are efficient. So I think this is remarkable. There is no free range rule, of course. The size of the SDP uh, grows rapidly. So if you have an initial problem with n variables, at step D of the hierarchy, you have this number of variables, which is very high. You have matri some matrix uh, of size O and D that should be positive semi-definite, and this is uh, painless for the uh, painful for the, uh, uh, the SDP solvers, at least for the one we have now. So uh, the question is how to handle larger size problems. One way that was already expressed yesterday also is to exploit symmetries, and uh, that this can be done very efficiently for some class of problems. There is this work by uh, 
particular Frank uh, Valentin was doing very nice, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, work uh, using symmetries. Uh, also, uh, uh, you can exploit sparsity in the data. You have uh, 1,000 uh, variable problems. Usually, each constraint that describes your problem involves usually a small number of variables. Okay, you can have 1,000 variables, but each constraint sees only a bunch of variables, like five, six, maybe. And uh, then you can exploit this description of your problem, where, where the sparsity, there is some, what is called some structure sparsity in, in the description of your problem. And then you can define a, ver a, ver a variant of this uh, SOSR key that takes into account this uh, sparsity and still preserving convergence and finite convergence for SOS convex problem. And now we can solve sparse non-convex quadratic problems with more than 2,000 variables on uh, uh, laptops. Uh, there were also some work to try to define more efficient positivity certificates. I don't go into details on that. So now let's go maybe to some application that uh, might be of interest uh, and to see if there, there will be some uh, sort of quantum analogs. Here I don't, I don't think there will be a quantum analog, but this is a uh, optimal control of nonlinear hyperbolic of, of ODEs and nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs. Uh, so, for what is a typical optimal control problem? So, you have a, a, an ordinary, ordinary differential equation that is the state of your system evolves like this. This is derivative in time. So, in time, your system evolves according to a differential equation, and you have some control available. You have start from an initial state, and your, your state has to be constrained to belong to some set, and your control has to to be long to some set, okay? Uh, in particular, when you have state constraints like this, this is a difficult problem. Okay, there was a huge literature on that. And there is uh, a way, uh, there is also what is called a weak formulation of the optimal control problem, which is an infinite dimensional uh, linear programming problem on a suitable space of measures. When you see this weak formulation of OCP, which, which dates back to at least 20 years, in fact, it's an instance of the JMP that we have seen before, okay? And under some conditions, which are satisfied in many, many cases, the optimal value of this of optimal control problem, uh, uh, the original optimal control problem, and this LP formulation, this weak formulation, have the same value. So they are equivalent. And when the vector field F of the ODE is a polynomial, and the set X and U are compact basic semi-algebraic set, then the moment SOS approach can be applied to approximate this value as called the as desired. Okay? So because then uh, you, have a, you have a generalized problem of moments with algebraic data. So you c everything we did for optimization, we have a, 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 a sort of adaptive hierarchy for this problem. Uh, it is a hierarchy of semi-defined programs of increasing size whose, co whose monotone associated monotone sequence of optimal values converge to the optimal value of your optimal control problems. And this is nice because it, it avoids a time discretization that people try to, to use this opti OCP by discretization, transfer this problem into a nonlinear programming problem of big size. And here you just avoid the time discretization. The same approach works. We tried very recently, uh, works for measure solutions, which is a, speci a specific weak formulation for certain nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs. For example, the Burgers equation is a, is, a, is a scalar equation of this type. It's a, a simple but non-trivial uh, hyperbolic uh, PDE. Okay? And the same approach can be done. There is a weak formulation of this problem in terms of measures, occupation measures. And it's a, again, it's an, another instance of the generalized uh, moment problem. And again, now you avoid the discretization of the TX domain. the machinery of the moment SOS, and uh, you, can, you can solve this problem and retrieve the solution. This is very recent work. I just submitted it uh, a month, a month ago. Uh, extension and related work in the, in the control community. So you can compute, for, for example, co polynomial Lyapunov function, which is very useful in, in control. Relation of attractions, sets of, the f of this form, level set of some polynomial. And you can also uh, do some convex optimization of nonlinear feedback controllers. So I, I know you are this is not your field, so I don't go into details, but 
And those really application of this uh, are key for this kind of problems. This is some peop people who work on this uh, stuff. The HTTP relaxation are also used for estimation problems, seen as min-max optimization. Probably stability analysis and probability disability analysis. Probably this doesn't tell you much to you. Uh, list of problems in this case. And uh, nice work by the Pigargi, Ruto, and Snyder for detection of anomalies and of causal interaction in video sequences. Very nice work using these hierarchies. Inverse optimal control, which is also a nice uh, application. It comes from a robotics application. So you have a humanoid robotic, a robot, sorry. And the idea is you want to understand human work. And uh, what you do is you record some trajectory to do a precise task. For example, you start from here, and the, the, your robot has to open the door there. So he walks, he will do something, and you, do, you, you, you record a lot of trajectories by different initial states of your human doing this, okay? And the, the question is, uh, when you do that, do you minimize some Lagrangian? Are you do doing, do you minimize something in your head when you do this, this kind of movement, okay? So do you start from the trajectory in the you know the differential equation that governs your robot or your human, okay? And you want to recover if those trajectories are, are optimal for some Lagrangian. So it's an optimal control problem. And it's nice because there's some debate into the neurosciences and the control community because people, some people in neuroscience uh, do not agree that a human is minimizing some criterion. So, but if you assume it, it does, you want to compute the inverse uh, Lagrangian. And there is a way to do that. You compute the Lagrangian for which those trajectories are optimal. And the key idea is to use the hamilton jacobi bellman equations. It's a perfect tool to certify global optimality of a trajectory. So we're going to use that. And the key idea number two is to approximate this hamilton jacobi bellman uh, uh, condition by polynomials. Okay. And again, this, this translates into optimality, uh, into positivity condition, and then use those positivity certificates. And indeed, you can recover some Lagrangian. And uh, that match, uh, when you, then when you, you do the direct problem with your Lagrangian, you recover the trajectories in your database. You can also approximate sets with quantifier. I don't go into much details. It's just you have a set with two sets of variables, and you have constraints. The set, suppose this is a noise, for example. This is a decision variable. This is a noise. And you would like to approximate a set of the, of the following form. You want to find some x in the ball, so that this constraint is satisfied for all y, such that x, y belongs to k. So for all noise, OK, would like this to be true. So it's sort of a robust set. And you can approximate this set, which is a difficult set, by a sequence of sets increasing, which are contained in this set and are very simple to describe and to com by a polynomial. And to compute the GK, you need to solve a hierarchy of SDP. I don't go into details, but uh, using put in a certificate, you to build up hierarchy of SDP. And the optimal solution of this hierarchy is, is a vector GK, which is the, the vector of coefficient of some polynomial of degree 2K. And when you, when you output this set, it is contained in, in, the, in this one, and the difference goes to zero. Convex underestimator, so I don't go into this uh, detail. Super resolution, so maybe it's more uh, related to what we have seen yesterday. So uh, very nice work by Candace in uh, 2010 or 12, I don't know. So it goes as a for it's a following problem. Suppose you have a it comes from signal processing. So you have a signal, C as a sign measure, okay, that you can measure. And you know that your signal is supported on, on a few atoms, but you don't know what where are the atoms. So you know that your signal is of this form. It's a a finite combination with positive and negative weights of some delta Dirac measures. Support on XK, but you don't know where the XK are. So you have access to some measurements. You don't know this guy, but you know this guy. So you, you can measure some moments of your signal. Okay. And the idea is, can you, from those, from finitely many measurements, can you retrieve phi star, that is the, the weight, and the atom? That's called super resolution in signal processing. And what, 
was remarkable was the result of the paper by Candice. Uh, he showed that uh, there is an infinite dimensional LP associated with this problem. So now you are going to look for a measure, uh, measure of phi, sign measure. Okay. Of course, you know in general the domain, K, on which your signal is supported. And you impose that uh, your, your, your measure, your sign measure should satisfy the moment constraints, of course. Okay. Finitely many moment constraints. And among all those phi sign measures that satisfy this, you choose the one that minimizes the total variation. See this as a L1 norm in the space of measures. Uh, so initially, the paper by Candace and Fernandez Granda was on the bounded interval of the real line, so a univariate problem. They can transform this on the torus. And what is remarkable in this, in this paper is that it could prove that if your atoms, you don't know where they are, but if your atoms are geometrically separated by a sufficient distance, okay, and you have enough moments, not many, but enough, then phi star is the unique solution of this problem. And then, after this is true, then you can have a, an exact recovery by just solving an, a single SDP. Okay? So this, this paper has, was a lot of success, and it, ma it makes some buzz, actually. And, uh, okay. uh, and how do you write it as an SDP? Then you write your sign measure as a difference of two positive measures. So your moment constraint do are exactly this one, because phi equals phi plus minus phi minus, right? And then the total, the total variation is just equal to this, because they will assume when you minimize, they will have disjoint support. Okay? But this is uh, just a, a GMP, right? And the dual reads that you have some uh, p variable associated to these constraints. When you do the dual, you would have uh, PQ, which is uh, the, the uh, polynomial. Okay, you, um, you look for a polynomial p, so that PQ is uh, so, so your polynomial has to be between minus one and one. Okay, and you want to minimize PQ. Uh, maximize, sorry. So extension to a, a compact semi-algebraic domain via the moment stress approach and finite recovery is also possible. We have done that in the sort of the more general uh, algebraic set and uh, not univariate. Okay. Now sparse polynomial interpolation. I was discussing this with, with you yesterday a little bit, uh, um, and that's maybe uh, as a link with what you presented yesterday. So what is sparse polynomial interpo interpolation? So you have a black box, which is a polynomial, which you don't know. And the only thing you can do is you can input a point, it's a polynomial in, uh, uh, in Rn, for example. So you have a point in Rn. You can choose any point you want. You, as an input in the black box, as the output, you observe the value of the, the polynomial. Okay? But you don't know what the polynomial is. And the idea is, can you retrieve uh, your polynomial, the coefficient of your polynomial, from uh, a few evaluations only. Okay? It's an inverse problem again. I claim that this is exactly super resolution, exactly of what we have seen before. And the trick is, is very uh, simple. So the, if P is a sparse polynomial, then few evaluations are needed. And the message that it, it can be P can be considered, your, the, your unknown polynomial, your black box polynomial, can be considered as a sine Borel atomic measure on the n torus. How do we do this? And then w once you have seen this, this retrieving P is only from uh, only a few evaluations. It's just a super resolution problem, exactly in the way we have seen for the Candace paper. How do you see that? It's, it's just one slide, very easy. So observe the following. You fix a Z0, a point Z0 on the end torus, OK? And P, uh, P that, that you don't know is a, uh, as a certain degree can be written like this. So if, if you evaluate P at, the p at this point, okay, it's equal to the sigma of P alpha, Z0 beta to the power alpha. Okay? And so it's, it's equal to this, right? And the nice thing is that you can interchange the beta and the alpha. Okay? So when you do that, sigma of P alpha, what is this, this term here? It's just the moment beta of the Dirac delta measure at the point Z0 alpha. See that when you when you when you do z zero alpha to the power of beta, you, it's the same thing as taking the moment beta of the delta Dirac measure at the point z zero alpha. Okay. 
So when you sum up, you have Z beta, sigma of P alpha, delta zero alpha. Okay, and you call this mu. So, uh, and then when, so when you evaluate Z zero, uh, P at the, at the point Z zero to the power beta, you are, you are just doing, the, you are just computing the moment beta of this measure. And this measure is what? It's a, it's a measure where the weights are just the coefficient of your polynomials, it's a sign measure. And the atoms are just the monomials D0 alpha. Okay? Very simple. Trivial almost. But then, once you have seen that, uh, you see that every polynomial X can be viewed as a sign Borel measure mu on the torus once you have fixed a certain D0 arbitrary on the torus. Okay? The support will be all these uh, uh, points on the torus, and the weights will be the coefficients. And the evaluation of the polynomial at the, at the point beta is a moment of uh, measure. So it's to do with some, uh, you see now what I mean uh, with the discussion we had yesterday? So it rings some bell for you, right? Probably. Uh, hence, recovering a sparse polynomial P from few evaluations is equivalent to recovering a measure mu with sparse support on, T on the multi torus from few moments provided that the moments are not any moments, but just these evaluations. Okay. You fix an arbitrary point Z0, and you take only the evaluation, you don't take any evaluation of P, you take those precise evaluations at all powers, a certain finitely many powers of Z0. And Z0 can be, you can choose your Z0 uh, fixed. And this is exactly a super resolution problem. So to give you an example to see how this can be very powerful, even if you have a very large degree polynomial. Let's just take this univariate example where your polynomial, a non-polynomial in your black box, in fact, is this one, it has three atoms, degree 80, okay? And, and it has degree D, and uh, only three monomials out of potentially 80. So for example, you choose Z0, like this one, on the torus, that is a unit circle on the complex plane, Okay, and you, it's amount to find a measure T with three atoms out of potentially 101. Okay, so exact result is obtained with four evaluations, and with an SDP that has two Pritz matrix of size by four by four, very stable, and that's what you observe. So your torus, uh, the, 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 the circle here, so you have two atoms with uh, positive weights and one with negative weight. Remember, your, your polynomial was two positive weights and one negative weight. And in a dual, you have a certain polynomial that touches one, it's, it's a polynomial between minus one and one. It will touch one at the two points of, of positive weights, and it will touch minus one at the negative, uh, at the points where it's negative coefficient. That was with V0. But you can play with V0. If you take, for example, V0 and now it's, you know, points are much separated on the torus. And you have your polynomial is much better. And remember that in Candes, for exact recovery in Candes uh, theorem of uh, uh, super resolution, you need the, the atoms to be sufficiently separated for exact recovery. So with a bad choice of this zero, it could be too small. There could be two, uh, two, two atoms which are too, too close. But you can play with the Z0. And you know, of course, there is no simple rule. But playing with the Z0, you can, you can uh, make your atoms uh, more distant. Tensor decomposition, exactly the same story. So it's, let's take a two, this was a paper by uh, Tang Sha and Potashin, those guys from computer science. So they were considering a, a cubic tensor. I will tell you why it's cubic. Uh, uh, and then the, the coefficient of your tensor, you want to find the, 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 the rank one decomposition, right? You want to write A like this. This is a difficult problem. And they take it cubic because they want to a positive uh, uh, decomposition. And of course, when you have a, a, a lambda i uh, negative, then you could put the minus sign in, in here, and you can have lambda i positive. Okay? But it works, it will work. They didn't want to have a uh, sign measure. That's why the reason is you will see this as a measure. So if you interpret your coefficient of your tensor as the moment of some measure mu on the sphere. Right? If you write this, 
It's an atomic measure on the sphere. Okay? And this is a moment, the cubic moment of your measure. All cubic moments of your measure. So given A, given your tensor, your coefficients, retrieving the decomposition, the rank on decomposition, is, uh, um, uh, is also a, a super resolution problem. You have a, a, a measure mu, atomic, support on the sphere, okay? You have some information on it, some measurements, and you want to retrieve your atoms and your weights. It's again a super resolution problem. And, uh, but in fact, it can be done, as we've seen, it can be done for any tensor, not cubic, for, but a sign measure. You could have positive and negative weights, okay? And it would still work by exactly what we have seen before. So it's again a super resolution problem. Retrieve an atomic measure on the sphere from knowledge of a few moments only. Yes? Because your, your, you, your you are uh, normalized uh, norm one vectors. That's possible. That's just a, yeah, it will be a rank one decomposition, just not maybe the best one. Sorry? Well, uh, actually, I don't know. Uh, you, maybe you should read this paper. I, I, this is not my work, but I just wanted to make the link between this, this as a super resolution problem. So, uh, but they were pretty uh, excited by this result, those, those guys from computer science. And there was an ICM, David Sturer, uh, was talking about this. Uh, this uh so I don't, I'm not answering your, your, your question. But, uh, I tried to present some application and it's possible with some possible links in quantum, and then I'm not a specialist of this area. I just want to, to see that this is just a super resolution problem. Okay. Six, another application uh, uh, where it can be done very efficiently. So when you design experiments, you, you look at the response, okay? You have a certain basis of function, and you, do, you fix your TI, where the point where you do the experiment, you observe your output and you want to find if it's a regression with polynomial basis with potentially some noise, okay? And the, in, in the regression, you want to find the coefficient theta j. But one important question is, uh, how do you choose the point ti while you do your experiments to minimize the variance, some statistical variance of your, of your uh, uh, theta, okay? Uh, Okay, so you have to choose the TI in a certain manner to be to have a, uh, an efficient estimator. So the goal is to find appropriate points TI in some design space X. So usually what they do, they have a, fi a list of points. And among this list of points, you have to choose some of them with a certain frequency. Okay, so a design is just the list of points and the frequency at which you choose point X1, point X2, point Xn when you do a, an experiment. And for this, you have an information matrix, which looks like in quantum a little bit. This is an information matrix with a basis of function, okay? So this information matrix associated with this design is just this matrix, okay? Which is a moment matrix. So, uh, okay? Well, design is concerned with finding a set of points in the design space that optimize a certain statistical criterion, F of this moment matrix, information matrix. But F must be real values, positive homages, non-constant, a person continuous, blah, 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 <laughs> and concave. And an important choice, for example, is a classical choice in, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, criteria is the log depth of the uh, moment matrix. So what people want to, how do they solve? Usually they do a disc discretization of the design space. And they use a convex, this is a convex optimization problem. They have a discretization of the design space and look at uh, 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 the weights, lambda, as an unknown, and it's a, it's a, it's a non-linear programming problem uh, once you have the, uh, do, do that. There is a way to do that without discretization. With the moment that's approach, you do not, again, discretize the, the design space, but you rather search, again, for an atomic priority measure of muonics. So your point will be the Dirac, your point at which you do the experiment will be those point xk, with some weights would be the frequency at which you use the, the, the point xk. And this one, you see this as an as a atomic measure, okay, on the design space. 
with weights positive. Your base function, uh, when there are polynomials, if you want to solve the infinite-dimensional convex problem, where you, 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 should, you look at the, the maximum of over all probability measure mu on the design space, that maximizes the log depth of the moment matrix. Okay? And that works extremely well. Uh, it was very surprising. Uh, it works very well. We have applied that uh, to uh, diff different uh, design, uh, uh, design space, not necessarily convex, complicated shape. And uh, for example, uh, this was uh, we have done some benchmark on, on known example by people in the literature for on the, sph on the sphere, for example, on the polygon. So th doing this, you see the point and, and the degree d equal three. When you have your base function are all polynomials up to degree three, these are the optimal point you should choose in your set to do the experiments. On the sphere, that's the same thing, and just by solving SDP. So I will I will end up by. Uh, uh, I claim that, uh, at least in the commutative world, there is a nice framework uh, of LP on space of measure where the, uh, that, uh, that can capture uh, s several problems and where you can apply the moment s hierarchy just exactly like So the way framework will be like this. You, you again, you, you look for a measure of phi. Okay. You have some type of constraints. Of, you have some linear constraints on phi by some known Everything in blue is the data. So you have some function G, family of functions. So you have some constraints, some generalized moment type constraints on phi. And for example, phi could be dominated by some reference measure. So I claim this framework is very nice for a lot of applications. Right. And to apply the moment S hierarchy, K has to be a semi algebraic set. Uh, F and G are polynomials. And of course, what you need also something that. This reference measure of mu is such that all the, the moments of mu are available. Okay. So, for instance, this framework can be used to compute sharp upper bounds on mu of k given some moment of mu. That's a classical problem in statistics, and you have a, a random variable, and uh, you want to see uh, what the probability that uh, the random variable falls into the set k. And you have sharp upper bounds, and the only thing you know of your, of, of your random variable, you know only a few moments of this random variable. So you don't know the distribution, you know only some moments, and you would like to know the upper bound on the probability that uh, the random variable uh, belongs to K. You can also approximate as close the design from below and above the Lebesgue volume of K. So you have a, a non convex, possibly disconnected set K. Okay. Or the, and you want to compute the Lebesgue volume of K or the Gaussian measure of K. That's, you can approximate this as, as close as desired. Chance constraint, which is now becoming a popular topic in control. Uh, so you have an epsilon positive, which is fixed, uh, some probability distribution mu, which is known, and you would like to approximate as closely as desired a set of this form. So a set of X, your decision variable, so that the probability according to the noise omega, so which are the distribution, Known mu. You would like to to, set, to compute the set of fixes so that the probability of f of x f is given, that uh, the probability that this polynomial is non-negative greater than one minus epsilon. And you would like to approximate this set. You can approximate it as closely as desired by level set of some polynomials. A little bit like we have seen in, in previous application. So you fix a degree d and you want to compute a set like this that approximate this set from inside. And so that when d increases, your approximation is as a, uh, is guaranteed to be uh, uh, optimal. So we have done this kind of things. Uh, we have already done some work on that, but uh, this this framework is very general. So as I say, the list of potential applications of the GMP is almost endless. In fact, there is a nice uh, book was written it was in eighty seven, and at the so it's a very nice book because there's a collection of uh, by leader in several domains. In operator theory, geometry, uh, statistics, uh, operator theory, uh, functional analysis, and they all state the general moment problem, say how it can be very useful to some solve some applications. But the, this was written in '87, four years before Schmundgen put in our theorem. So they were always uh, frustrated because they say, "Oh, it's very nice, but you don't know how to compute it." So th this one is not the list of all applications, but it's a very nice book. Uh, where you see a lot already of uh, 
theoretical application of the generalized moment problem. So thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, the counter has stopped, no? But anyway. Uh, uh, I had some more time? No, um, no it's actually... No, no.